Listener Production. I'm automotive commentator and journalist Greg Rust, and this is Rusty's Garage. In this episode, I'm at Phillip Island in the Kawasaki team's hospitality area with their superbike star, Jonathan Ray. Now the goat in this sport, Ray is just about to start his bid for a fifth straight title. To be able to chat one-on-one for this long on the eve of race weekend, the start of a new season, is almost impossible when it comes to World Championship Motorsport. But Jonathan is engaging and proud of his incredible achievements, even if the milestones didn't sink in straight away. When I passed Foggy's record of 59 victories, that was kind of that was a moment where I thought, hey, I can finally be proud of you know being talked about in the same breath as these guys. And for many years, you know, when I equaled Bayless's three titles. I kind of looked at them guys as heroes. I never really put myself in the same bracket. And uh, it was actually a journalist who told, read out my stats to me after my third championship. And he said that I was equal in championships with Troy Bayless. I thought, no way, really? <laughs> so that was kind of a, a moment where I thought, hey, maybe um, you know, I'm doing a good job. And it kind of sinking in a little bit. Motorsport connections for you go go way back for people that maybe haven't haven't heard the stories what are your earliest memories of of your grandfather's involvement and even your, your dad's own racing because it, it was your life wasn't it? yeah to be honest i was so young i can't remember too much about my granddad before he passed away but i remember just his legacy of supporting irish motorcycle racers road racers especially joey dunlop and and then my dad as well so my earliest memories of bikes was kind of running around the race paddocks with my dad generally get in the way of his mechanics and when they were doing wheel changes and whatnot and I can remember being super proud of him and always wanting him to win and seeing the seeing the difference a race win made to him or if he had a bad day and whatnot so I think that that kind of was really infectious you know I wanted to do that and of course you can't race a super bike when you're five years old but you can race a motocross bike so that was the natural stepping stone to get a motocross bike and start riding dirt bikes are the stories of of you uh, you know on the lounge at home leaning off the uh, the arm and kind of commentating your own bicycle race is that all true yeah yeah completely <laughs> especially the bicycle race thing I remember I used to have my mum take lap times around the house I mean it was only a 20 second lap or something but I was I was always focused on lap times since I was so young and and then I would pretend I won a race I don't know why but I'd always do a post race interview in an American accent I guess it was because you know Jeremy McGrath was one of my heroes and you know growing up Swans as well and I, I'd hear them guys and my Texan uh, accent's not that great but <laughs> yeah I used to f- uh, feel like I was Kevin Swans and, and um, that was, <laughs> it was really cool it's something I did and I used to think it was hilarious what is it I mean heroes are important for anyone when you're younger like that what was it about Schwantz and McGrath that, that you saw and that you admired well my my grandfather travelled the Grand Prix circuit with Joe Miller and there was a Miller racing 500 Grand Prix team from Northern Ireland my dad was always sponsored by Joe so they went together and and he got me a he did a championship year I think it was 93 he, uh, he released a book, like a picture book, and he signed it to Jonathan, best wishes, Kevin. And I used to think he was the dog's balls, you know? He would, <laughs> he was the guy that would turn up with a broken collarbone or wrist and manufacture things in the bike to make it more comfortable and still go out and win. You know, he had no business beating the might of HRC and doing and whatnot, and and he did it in inferior machinery, and I kind of liked his, his attitude. But they say you should never meet your heroes, and it was definitely the case with Swans. I met him... You know, when we were, we had a mutual sponsor and we were in a hospitality suite once and I just interrupted him for a minute and said, hey man, you're, you're my hero. And, and he gave me absolutely nothing. He was busy. I was like, oh shit, what a dick. And then he was, you know, he came to Imola one year and I think it was 09 with my manager, Chuck Axland, and we went out for dinner and I told him this story and he was the life and soul of the party. And, you know, he's, he's one of the only guys now that texts me every race you know win or lose whatever he's always sending me messages so I always think that was incredible because um, 
you know, I must have just caught him in a bad moment because he's such a good guy, and it's kind of ironic. You know, he was he was my real hero, and McGrath just because you know, growing up in motocross, he dominated Supercross and motocross back in the early nineties. You got your first bike around the age of two. I think, did your dad have to part with some money from the TT success in order to buy that bike? And it was like a cold Christmas day, and you would not stop riding it. Is that true? That, that was it. You know, it's um, my hands were not even big enough to. To reach the brake lever, so he had. Exp- I kind of got. He used to always sit me on his bikes and I'd rev them. Yeah. But I kind of never figured out brakes, so I was just on the. We had lucky by a big piece of you know garden that I didn't crash into anything. But <laughs> I got it straight away, and I think I actually rode a motorbike before I rode a bicycle without pe- um, stabilizers. Amazing. So it was um, pretty cool. But technology is mental. You know, my two kids now they're riding balance bikes, and they went straight from that to pedal bikes and. Now with all these like little electric motocross bikes being invented now, they were riding at two years old. It's mental. So, um, yeah, for me it was an Intelligent 50, and then um, then I just wanted to race. And it was yeah, when I raced, then I wanted to win. And when I started winning, I never wanted it to stop. Pee Wee was the first proper race bike, wasn't it? But it was. She was a pretty wet day, and I don't think it ended too well. <laughs> no, I uh, I rode through a puddle, and the old electronics and the Pee Wee were weren't the best, you know. So it, it stopped. I remember being in hysterics, crying and crying, and Dad sort of had to tell me to stop being spoiled brat. These things happen, and and um, I moved straight. I think. There was an Italian bike, uh, a Malagotti 50. That was my first proper racing bike because the Pee Wee, I, I only did a few race meetings in that. And then there was the 50cc modified class. So I had this Malagotti 50 and it was a pretty fast thing. It was good and um, it doesn't feel fast at the time. But then now when I see, sometimes I take my Jake's little 50 up and down the the lane, you know, just to run it in and whatnot and check the brakes before we go riding. And they're weapons, you know, so fast. So so um, it's kind of cool to see that kids can, you know, get involved in motorsports so early. Do you see in them the same sort of things that you were doing? And are you cool with the fact that they may follow the same path? Because clearly they, they seem passionate about it, don't they? Yeah, they both do. And they're both really different. Um, I mean, I don't really see... I don't see what myself and any of them to be honest they're really quite different um, I mean one very methodical and uh, a- analytical and kind of smooth on the bike and he, he's getting faster and faster Jake and loves it Tyler on the other hand he's he's only three so I shouldn't really judge him too much but he didn't really care but then he gets on his, his electric bike or even the PW and he's rocking you know he does, does everything right sticks his leg out when he should and it's kind of thinking like that he doesn't care if I say hey do you want to ride today he's like no so it's kind of funny and then I watched Jake have his first proper big crash and there's a kid crashed his bike in front of him on a on a downside of a jump and he hit it how's that as dad the, the racer who's been through that how did, how did you find that yeah he, he hit him pretty hard it was the first time I, re- I ran straight across the track to get to him and um, he seemed just a bit dazed but he completely ragdolled and I got I got scared you know and so I'm happy for them to ride bikes and whatnot, and if if they really want to, of course I wouldn't. It's an expensive sport in itself, and I prefer to hang up my boots and go and have nice family holidays after racing. <laughs> I don't really fancy hanging around a race paddock for the rest of my life. But if that's what they want to do, and it's given me a great life, and not just from a career point of view, I've met so many good people, and a lot of my friendships are forged through motorbike racing. I mean, I I lost touch with all my school friends. They're all through, you know, all my core. F- uh, friends are from motocross or, or road race so it's it's given me a, a great life from that point of view you and i are sitting here talking inside the the kawasaki hospitality now at the world superbike round at, at phillip island but your connection in some respects with with green machines actually goes goes back a ways when you were 10 i think didn't you have a kx60 and you had some good success on that machine yeah i mean that's the aside from my world championships this is the only other major championship i won i won the the national uh, British 60cc championship in 97 and um, you know I rode Kawasaki through my younger schoolboy years before moving on to other manufacturers and it's just kind of fitting you know that my my next major championship is a world championship with them and in fact that my the Kawasaki re- operations manager from Europe Steve Gottridge who I do a lot of contracts and whatnot with he was the team green schoolboy motocross manager when I motocross so this a, it's a really big connection and it's quite cool that he's involved in this road race program now I think I read somewhere that you don't consider yourself to be 
a good mechanic. Is, no. is that true? No, definitely not. <laughs> Why? I, mean, I do. A, we normally do a motocross camp every year in Spain. In the last three years, I've um, I've gone myself, and I, there's always something that happens to my bike. <laughs> you know, I destroyed spokes one year. I've um, I had a sprocket bolt come out one year and sheared the sheared the swing arm. This year I brought my own mechanic, so um, <laughs> just to keep on top of things. But yeah, I'm, I'm t- my bike's always the cleanest one on the paddock, but it's not always guaranteed to finish the race. I'm talking about my personal bikes, yes. now, you know, my, <laughs> my bike. Yeah, right. you know, my mechanics here at KRT are second to none, and touch wood, we haven't had too many issues. The love of the motocross thing was something I wanted to touch on a little bit more as well. That that pre-season training that you've done like that, how beneficial have you found that? It's become routine now. It's almost um, part of what I want to do and it's kind of a bit of superstition I attached to it but when I first joined KRT I'd come from nine years being in a, another team and or eight years being in another team and I was coming in as a sort of clear you know I'd joined Tom Sykes who was 2013 world champions so I wanted to go and meet my team and start forging a relationship in the off season and, and I did that and then it's just become part of what I do I think from a physical point of view, motocross is, is is good, but it's not the best preparation because obviously you can. It's very risky, yes. but from a point of view of concentration, it's incredible. You know, the track's always changing. You have to make split sec, um, split second decisions on the bike, and it's kind of you can kind of replicate some things with your brain. What you're doing in the superbike, you know, that things are coming at you so fast in the superbike that you have to make them little decisions at the same time. So. Um, it's as much about mental preparation for them 35 minutes or whatever that it, than it is physical. Your good friend Andrew Pitt, the, the double world super sport champion, reminded me of just, just how deep that love is for, for motocross, for supercross and things like that. It's probably a hard one to answer because you've had some great success in circuit racing. Which is the greater love for you? Um, I think... It's difficult because I really, I really am. Enjoy- I was, you know, a few years ago I'd have said motocross, um, but I'm really enjoying my job right now at Kawasaki here. I'm enjoying the atmosphere and the team. But I think from from a real personal point of view, it has to be motocross because I can load my bike up pretty much in my own van and go and hang out with my mates, and there's no stress involved with it, and it and it's good fun. Where when I throw my leg over the ZX10R, it's. Uh, it's tough, you know, I'm paid to come here and be fast and in the end try to sell motorcycles for Kawasaki and that's good when it's going great but when you have a tough day and things, you know, you're under pressure a bit and you have to find that next half a second or tenth of a second, it's really tough and um, so I don't enjoy that, I don't enjoy this pressure side of things, I get nervous, I always get nervous, especially before the before the start of every single race so the motocross thing is a lot more um, easy going people would probably be quite surprised by the fact that you get nervous I mean here you are four, four world championships greatest ever in in, in uh, superbike terms but you get nervous yeah I think I just think it's the you know I I've dealt with uh, back in my early days I always I dealt with some sports psychologist and I was always one that was thinking what if this happens? But in a negative way, you know, what if I get a bad start? Or what if the, this guy does this in the first lap? Or what if my tyre is not the right one today? Or whatever. Where now I've learned to control all that that feeling. I, I've got good processes to go through before. But I still get nervous, you know, going to... It's like a nervous excitement as well. I'm excited to ride the bike, but I'm always nervous that... Um, things don't go the way I want because in your brain before a race I always use some visualisation techniques and always visualise the perfect start and how things should be and I get nervous that it's not going to play out how I imagine so I'm, I'm quite real as well you know sitting down before a race weekend I can kind of understand where the race weekend's being without pumping up my own tyres if you like and um try and bring a bit of reality to it. A lot of athletes often talk about having a, a, a nervous a nervous wee, a nervous piss before the race. Oh, yeah. And, and, and trying to, you know, bike races forever have tried to sneak them on the grid. You can't do that now because there's big fines. No, well, do you know, I, I just wrote a book recently <laughs> and it's the only thing that never reached the book, I forgot to say, because my mechanic was waiting. I had a piss in my leathers once <laughs> at Donington Park and I could never do it normally because of the nerves. Yeah. And then... At Donington Park, 2016 or 17, is the race I won actually. It must have been 17, and um, I had a bit of a dribble, <laughs> and it was obviously coming down 
running down the bike and there was a little pool of fluid on, under the bike. And my chief mechanic, without warning anyone, not just my other mechanic or two, he said, and points down at the piss on the ground and and he does a whole finger dab and like finger tested it oh, no, no. and he told me he says he came back he didn't say anything he was kind of relieved then but when I got back to Park Fermi he was pointing his finger in my face telling me you, you dick you pissed on the bike didn't you and I was like oh yeah sorry I forgot about that but yeah so um, yeah, our relationship is pretty strong to be fair I'll bet, I'll bet congratulations on the book I mean it, it I don't know you well enough to say this, but it sounds like just you talking as you as you read the the book. Yeah, exactly. It's um, I kind of when I wanted to do, I wanted to be honest. Um, firstly, when I I thought it's way too young to do an autobiography, and then I had you know, my profile in the UK was rising, rising, especially with um, I went to a, a sports awards and finished runner up to these established stars, and I had a, f- a few book offers, and I thought, no way, really. And then in the end, my publicist sat down and we had five offers. I thought, oh, I might as well write a story now and yeah. let's see. And um, I wanted to, the publishers were all quite, um, and they all had different deals on the table. And I was quite strong. I wanted to write a story how I wanted, not how the market would receive it or how a story they wanted to tell. Or, and, and, and they let me write my own story, which was nice. I did it with a, a great co-writer and good friend of mine Steve Booth and um, you know he helped me I wanted to be open and honest and you know if people didn't like some of the things in there I couldn't hide behind it because it's how I felt and um, I think people that only see my career recently see the success but they didn't see the times where I was sort of doctors telling me I could never race again or you know the the geographical um challenges of living in Northern Ireland, you know, going to Europe to race and going to the UK to race in the early days and the sacrifices my parents made was was nice to write back. That was the, f- the funnest part, you know, writing the early chapters because I was kind of reminiscent of, um, you know, times back in, when I was growing up through schools and whatnot. It was nice. The, the injury list for any bike racer is normally quite big and it is, it is for you but you brought up there a minute ago the, the, the crash when you were 17 you smashed your, your femur your leg and the doctors really were basically saying not only would you not race again but you wouldn't ride it yeah well I broke my femur so bad that they I mean they fixed me pretty good it took three operations over a 10 month period to get things right four operations sorry over a 10 month period to get, to get it right and then it started to heal and um, they just told me that I couldn't, my leg couldn't withstand another crash. So of course I could ride again, but it was under this doctor's advice that I should never ride a bike again, which in some sicko way just kind of fired me up to prove this guy wrong, you know? And it was, um, you know, I couldn't mention any names in the book, but I did tell that story of, it's kind of daunting, you know, sitting down as a 17 year old and a professional doctor and telling you can't ride. But it, it did go in one ear and out the other. I was sat beside my performance manager at the time, Darren Roberts, and he was used to dealing with athletes that were come back from much worse. So, um, yeah, it's, it's a broken leg at the end of the day, bones heal, and I had a great support network around me in the end. It was a tough time mentally because I thought I was kind of just on the cusp of doing okay at bike riding, but not. I wasn't getting wages or anything, so I was thinking shit this could be me in just like a normal 9 to 5 and I had no plan for 9 to 5 so you'd not, you wouldn't have what would Jonathan Rye have done I did not have a backup plan so it was kind of I was in a real dark place of where what my life was going to be but in the end I got a lifeline I got a super bike ride in the British Championship and a, a chance and that kind of fired me up in them dark months to get ready for 2005 it was yeah 2005 when I was 18 when you got that visit from Neil Tuxworth and, and you know Red Bull and things like that you clearly were not expecting them to offer you the the British Superbike ride, were you? That was the last thing you thought they would tell you at that stage. Yeah, definitely. Um, I mean, I was I was a bigger guy. I was always sort of you know I'm much lighter than I was back then. I was a chubby little guy, <laughs> but um, yeah, I wasn't cut out for super sport. You know, I was a solid unit back then, and they wanted to. They thought my riding style was good for superbike, and you know, Red Bull were really back then to show that there was a stepping stone from 1 to 5 to super sport to super bike in the national championship so when I I did an okay rookie year and then the second year I I beat Harris in the Carl Harris in the official team and Shane Byrne to fourth in the championship and it kind of that put an end to the 
and Eugene Lavery in the same year finished second in the British Supersport Championship. So it was kind of uh, justification for the budget from Red Bull, if you like, mm. that they'd done what they set out to do. You know, they pretty much took pizza boys that had no CV to be right up there in the national championship. Nice. Okay, I came from motocross, so it was um, it was a good story. That project finished, and, and I signed for the for the official um, Honda team in the British Championship. In the book, there is quite a funny yarn about your your grandmother wonderful supporter uh, yeah, right yeah. right the way through and she got a bit uptight about the Honda machinery that you had at the time I mean you're doing your level best with it clearly and I think that's how you approached it in your in your mind but she wanted to address matters with them didn't she? oh yeah god love my nana she's her heart's in the right place and she rings me all the time and I sort of I have to I I have to just not answer a few calls because she would ring me all the time and then I answered this one call I remember I was sat in my motorhome and she said Jonathan you need to get me that guy that guy's number from Honda it's like what do you mean the boss of Honda what do you mean the boss there's <laughs> hundreds of us the, that bike of yours isn't it's not strong enough and the commentators are saying this and that I'm like flip me Nana you know get over it it's, it's, hard, it's kind of how it is the bikes yeah, sure. it's, and it's subjective as well you know I always felt at Honda that I had a they always done their best you know the team was the team was great unfortunately until since sort of 2002 um, Honda never took Superbike serious until ironically this year we're sat talking the HRC are back now with um, the Altea Honda team and Leon Camier and Kianari so at least uh, something's changed but whilst I was there it was a pretty much a private privately run team out of Holland and they done a great job I spoke to pity for this you guys were teammates at, at one point. What was he like to, to you know, uh, work with as a teammate? And you've become very good friends off track. Yeah, Pity's one of my best mates now. And we hang out quite a lot back then in super sport as well. He kind of, he took me under his wing a bit. Before I, when I signed for World Sort of Sport Championship, I went and stayed with him in his, um, his apartment up in the Gold Coast. Um, I actually spent Christmas and New Year there and with a friend of mine and we hung out. And he kind of, Going from the national championship to the world championship, it's a big step. You know, you, it's a lot of things to learn, airports, hire cars, and I was just young and dumb and kind of on the world superbike train. And he kind of took me under his wing and I educated me a little bit. And then um, I remember mid, mid, um, midday between sessions, we'd be in my motorhome watching episodes of 24, you know, the TV program 24. We ended up getting addicted to that together. But then the rivalry started at mid season, end of the season. I started doing pretty good and winning some races. So we created a bit of a rivalry. And then I ended up riding Super, Sport, Super Bike the following year, and, and Pity ended up staying in Super Sport. So we, the rivalry was kind of gone, and we, we sort of remained really good friends. And I think we got married in the same year, even 2012. Uh, and our wives are good friends. They're really good people, the pits. And, um, you know, just to, just yesterday, actually, we were in the park for his little boy's sixth birthday. So um, we like hanging out with AP. And he's, he's one of the good guys of the sport. And it's nice to see him. He's still a rival now. Bloody hell, he's working for <laughs> Alex Lowe. So we, we never talk anything technical nowadays. Unfortunately, he can't give me a heads up of um, how fast or how slow they really are at this test. But um, he's a super good guy. Here's a little slice of that chat with Pity and when he first noticed Jonathan Ray's potential for greatness. I think we saw, um, you know, when he got to do the, the one event at the end of the year, that first year on the Superbike in Portugal, Troy Bayliss' last race, um, he qualified on the front row on the Honda, um, which hadn't done a lot and, and since then hadn't, hasn't really done a lot ever, except in his hands. We, you know, over the years we chatted a lot about when it came up contract time, everyone wanted him to ride, but he never quite was game to take that step. And it, it, me and many other people were like, you've got to go, you got to got to get on to something else. And um, I sometimes think that he wasn't sure what would happen, you know, with the expectation if, if he would or wouldn't win. But I think everyone was sure it would happen. And, and we saw what happened when he finally, you know, BMW wanted him, Ducati wanted him, Yamaha wanted him eventually jumped to, to Kawasaki and, and we've seen what's happened and I think probably the only the sad thing out of it all is we're never going to see him in MotoGP um, I have no doubt he, he would compete at the front in MotoGP for sure um, because that boat has sailed from an age point of view from a timing point of view why why wouldn't that I mean I know he subbed for I'm talking to him about that about the fact that he subbed for Casey Stoner at yeah. one point yeah and you know a lot of people might think 7th and 8th 
that's where he finished on Casey's bike. But a lot of people don't realise too, both events that rained on Friday at Mizano and Aragon and they didn't want him to use Casey's engines, so he didn't really ride the bike. And he finished seventh and eighth. And, and you know, there's regulars in there in MotoGP that can't buy a seventh or an eighth after four years, five years on the bike. So, um, and, you know, he kind of doesn't fin- fit the Dorna Spanish championship, young Spanish kid, next Marquez type role. So they're, they're kind of not interested in him, which is call it a passport, you know, and he's not quite English, he's Irish. So um, I have no doubt that, that um, you know, on one of the factory bikes there, he would he would compete at the front. I'm not saying he'd beat Marquez or or whatever, but he would compete at the front. Um, and I, I think he, he would have won races, he'd be on the podium. Um, but, you know, it's, uh, it's a theoretical argument because we're never going to see it happen, unfortunately. And even at the end of last year, him and his management crew went around everywhere and just got the door slammed in their face and said, we're not interested in superbike riders, which is a shame. So um, he sort of settled with the fact that he'll make good money out of it, spend more time with his kids and do less races per year and race superbike and um, try and win another world championship. We'll talk more with Jonathan Ray on his championship success with Kawasaki in a moment. Superbike racing is a category of motorcycle racing that uses highly modified production motorcycles. As the slogan says, win on Sunday, sell on Monday. Okay, partnership with Kawasaki has been phenomenal. The first time you rode the Ninja, the ZX-10, what were your, what were your first impressions and what are your memories of, of, of that? Firstly, I, I couldn't believe how easy it was to ride. You know, the throttle response, and I was expecting this real animal because I could see it on track being so fast. But I soon realised then that a, a fast bike that makes a lap time is it's just an easy bike to learn, an easy bike to ride. And um, the team open like welcomed me with open arms. You know, Perry Reba created a great bond in, inside my little team and a nice happy place for me to kind of learn in the off season and start mounting the challenge. And then to win my first, you know, I had never even been in the podium at Phillip Island. Then we turned up here my first year with Cowie, and I don't think they'd been in the podium either. Uh, they certainly hadn't won a race for many years, and, and I turned up and won, which was nobody expected. And um, yeah, I can't quite, can't quite believe what, nobody was prepared for what happened next, really. We just, um, we kept winning and winning and winning. The bike now that you're about to contest the the 2019 championship, give people a bit of an insight into the into the machine in terms of in terms of horsepower. I mean, you talk about it effectively having kind of power to weight ratio that is very similar to Formula One in some respects. Yeah, I guess so. I think we probably out- accelerate a Formula One car in the first sort of 25 30 meters, and then once they start changing gears, they and uh, they drop us. Even with MotoGP, it's exactly the same. We do winter testing with them, and off the corner, we we have a slingshot on them bikes. Uh, but as soon as they start hooking gears, they accelerate <laughs> like like nothing else. So it's I don't exactly know horsepowers, but sort of plus two twenty horsepower, one seventy kilos. You know, it's resting that around the track. You know, trying to be on the same bit of tarmac every single time. The G forces, it's it's tough. What's that like around Phillip Island? I mean, it's such a legendary track here. What is it like to wrestle one around here? Well, it'd be a lot easier if there was no wind. Bloody <laughs> hell. You know, it's, it's so windy here. No matter what day you arrive, it's the wind somewhere, whether it's in your face or behind you or to the side of you. But it's um, it's uh, it's a real challenge, especially that change of direction up through the hay shed from Siberia. It's tough, you know, wrestling the bike, trying to put power to the ground because you're always on the side of the tyre. There's pretty much, aside from the start-finish straight, there's not many straights here where you're completely at zero degrees so it's um, it's a challenge it's a nightmare for f- to set up around here uh, the, the bike to be really good because you need a balance of stability but agility mm. you also need to look after the tyre for 22 laps it's notorious for putting a lot of stress on the rear tyre so the crew chiefs and suspension guys and electronic guys are definitely earning their money this week. You end up, I think, at times with a, a tyre contact patch that's about as big as your, your credit card or something, isn't it? I mean, it's really minor. What sort of top speeds around here? I think the top speed is around 217 Ks. We've seen this this weekend already. Uh, I think that was 
by one of the Ducati riders. I think was we were a few k's behind that. So it's fast. You know, it doesn't feel fast until you start braking. You know, it's, you're in a nice, happy place inside a warm helmet and earplugs in. It's kind of everything's under control until you sort of hit the brakes and have to change direction. And then it all starts again. So it's uh, pretty cool. You described one of your young blokes before being very methodical in the way he goes about stuff. Is that you? before the start of a race, when you go through launch control procedure, when you roll up and you're about to go, is it a, is it a method and, and following that? Pretty much. It's a, it's a habit now, or a routine. You know, I have, and I like to go through the same kind of routine before each and every race. Um, yeah, there's things I do that could be seen as superstitious or whatnot, but I always... Like what? Like what? Um, I know I always put my left side on before my right, and there's there's loads of things it's weird you know I always uh, put my helmet on at a certain time on the, the countdown timers and earplugs in at five minutes but yeah it's all these things just come force of habit really and um, yeah my mechanics all know that now and they sort of um, they just let it all go I'm not like weirdo or anything with it but it's I've definitely got a bit of a system looking at the evolutions of the bike since you joined Kawasaki how different is the bike to that first year that you that you race with them and what about the input that you brought to the table yes it's a team but but you've clearly had input on that yeah sure i think when i first arrived the bike was so strong they had a lot of years of development and 2015 the bike was solid 2016 they came with an all-new bike completely new shape engine chassis and it was really tough to to learn you know um my riding style probably wasn't the best for the bike and i had to reinvent myself a little bit Unfortunately, now the way the rules have gone these last years, I wish I could go back to how I kind of was in 2015 because now, you know, I've learned the bike's been, if you like, developed for guys like Tom uh, in the past who had a real stop and go style. So I've adapted that approach. I mean, my style now is more extreme than it was when I first joined. So um, now with um, we don't have the same amount of power or probably... We've probably dropped about 20 horsepower since uh, you know 2014. Um, over the the regulations being more simplified for other manufacturers and whatnot, so um, we've kind of just had to adapt with each and every rule change. Now um, the bikes are pretty close to what you can buy in the street, which is which is nice. And uh, of course, they spend a lot of money on parts and suspension and electronics. But um, this year we got an, a new update on our bike, which gave us a few more RPM. But that sort of 16, 17, 18 year was, was just growing pains, you know, reacting to the regulations and trying to get the bike in a good base setup. And, and now again, we have, you know, a different um, engine specification with more RPM that we, we're trying to adapt to because with all these little subtle changes, it makes a difference on the chassis as well. So we're sort of, uh, we had a great winter test until we came here and then we needed to you know, adapt the bike to Phillip Island and then Monday, Tuesday was a huge data finding um, weekend to put into practice for the weekend. So it's, um, we're always learning with this bike and it's, uh, it's always a big process. Lots of talk about the V4 power plant that rivals have, okay? So Alvaro Batista has been very good in the pre-season testing on the Ducati. Some say it's a bit like MotoGP Arsenal being brought to the table in this battle to try and beat you. Do you, do you feel that way? Um, certainly in the in the media, I can feel it a little bit, but uh, I no doubt he's a fast guy, super fast. He's a world champion in Grand Prix. Uh, when he, I forget the right, it must have been uh, Lorenzo. He mm-hmm. replaced when he was here at, in GP. He was on the podium, and um, so he's a fast guy. But of course, he needs to find his feet. He's going to be. Uh, he's been super fast here in the test. It's a great track for him. Um, Ducati seems to be working well. They were super serious when they built this V4 to come and um, try and win a Superbike. So that gives me a lot of motivation, you know, and kind of um, not that you kind of have to have someone or thing that motivates you, but it's it's good that he's here and he's fast because it makes me want to. You know, makes me want to step up even more and um, maybe that's after these four years and winning championship that's exactly what I need the four straight world titles I mean the numbers are absolutely remarkable that you've achieved along the way in the battle for each of, of those is there a standout one for you a standout title and why it's hard isn't it yeah there's a couple I think 2016 because it was a new bike uh, and also I was fighting not fighting 
my wife and I were struggling at home with our second child, Tyler, you know, who wasn't the most easy baby. So I remember breaking down when we got to Phillip Island in 16, thinking, you know, how the hell am I going to do another season? Like, how am I going to win a championship? Because we were getting no sleep. He had uh, silent reflux. And before he got him diagnosed, he was he had burnt the whole inside of his esophagus. So he's in constant pain, the little guy, but he's... Um, He's a bundle last now and completely healthy, but the first, that 16 sort of winter was was tough. I'd won a championship. Um, Kawasaki had me on a media trail around the world and Tars had just got pregnant. It was real hell them months. And um, and it was a tough few rounds. I kept thinking, how am I going to get through this season? And we ended up winning So with a new bike. So for me, that was the biggest... That was the biggest success so far, winning with the new bike in 16, and then um, and becoming a father for the second time and a sort of double whammy. On paper, do you feel like 19 is going to be one of the toughest you'll face? Well, it'll definitely be tougher than uh, last year because last year was pretty seamless, to be honest. We didn't face too many challenges. Um, but of course, yeah, I feel, I feel that. I can feel that. You know, a lot of manufacturers now are taking superbike serious. Um, you know, Tom, my ex-teammate, who's you know a huge talent, has moved to BMW. Who seemed to be, you know, stepping up the superbike. Ducati have come with this new bike, and Yamaha are race winners already last year three times. So, superbike has all the ingredients to be amazing. But of course, I want to keep on writing my story. It's, you know, the keep winning races, and I, f- I feel we can. I really feel motivated that I can keep winning. Um, but we'll see that's the beauty of it we haven't turned a wheel yet and everyone's excited so we'll just try and um, go out there and do my job Fabian as a riding coach I mean naturally there's a whole team of people around you but how, how valuable how important are those people and particularly him Fabian's great I, I sort of we um, we rented an apartment together in St Kilda Melbourne for a summer I think in 2011 and um, spent a lot of time with him and when he was retiring from world championship and just doing world endurance I felt I started feeling the need to have someone help me you know I had a very old school fixed style and I wanted to it's after I won my first championship I started feeling like this could be the top you know I might just tomorrow might not happen and I wanted to keep investing in myself and trying to stay there Mm. so I thought the next best thing was to bring a you know, rider coach John. I think it was one of the first guys to do it now in this paddock. Now it's become bloody fashion. Everyone's <laughs> everyone's got themselves not only a man friend, but they've got themselves a riding coach. So it's um, he's very good at helping me um, mentally prepare the weekend. Uh, in the beginning, I wanted him to help me on track with riding style and also analysing others what they were doing better than what I was doing. And then he's become more and more um, involved and in trying to help me prepare for the race mentally and we analyze other riders uh performance and the cron- like the lap times and whatnot and we can make a plan together um in fact the only time i didn't listen to his pl- plan last year i ended up on my ass and took out by my teammate because he had this you know and bruno our pace was so fast he told me listen you need to just get stuck in in this second race and come from ninth and and win and i was like oh mate no honestly i'm gonna like we made a plan to step by step just have a casual start so I ended up my first lap I made pretty much no positions I was fighting with Tom in 7th or 8th and then I got wiped out so it's probably my fault I didn't listen to Fabian and get my head down from turn 1 but he's he's a cool guy he's actually qu- he was quite fiery as a rider but um, working together he's very calm also and um, it's quite good for me because sometimes when you're inside Kawasaki or the team you just see everything as everything's the best you know and and sometimes having them honest eyes out on track where there's no bias in your eyes he can say hey listen it's probably the best the bike's going to be this weekend we can't you need to get on and ride it now or um, stop looking for time in this area because you're not going to find it or I mean he's also he's really good at sort of patting me on the shoulder and helped me out but he's I've had a lot of bollockings off Fab as well for you know uh, you know I come in and complaining about stuff and he tells me what are you complaining about you're not even trying I'm like yeah I'm busting my ass he's like no you're not you're cruising I think it was Argentina it was a new track and I I I got him a radio last year in free practice too 
and I sent him out to Chicane and asked him, hey, is, I need to find out if people are running the inside curb on the on the first part. And anyway, it sort of, I came in like middle of the session, he was in the box. I said, what are you doing? He says, I'm not even going to watch. He says, you're just cruising. I said, what do you mean I'm cruising? <laughs> so he's, he's, he's one of them. He's super honest with me, doesn't let me get away with much. And, and I really appreciate that because... Um, because you need you need that now because we're we're at the top level and all these little parts help so mm. sometimes the the biggest thing in racing is your brain so if you've got someone helping you in an honest way whether it be const- has to be constructive but if it's sometimes hard to hear I'd rather hear it from Fabian than anybody else Aussie bike racing fans will remember the fact that you subbed for, for Casey Stoner in, in MotoGP what they may not remember, of course, is that that was an immensely busy period for you. I think you went back to back between MotoGP and World Superbike races. There was probably hardly a break there in weekend yeah. terms, was it? I think there was uh, six weekends in a bounce, and I was coming from Suzuki eight hours uh, and a test thrown in there in the middle of it all. So I, I think, let me get this straight. Tars will kill me, but I got married the seventh of July, and then I went to do the eight hour on the end of July and pretty much from that I came back the summer break and sort of bike for a couple of weeks and then I went back to back sort of bike and MotoGP for five weekends it was nuts and the biggest difference was the the Bridgestone front tyre at the time was it was like wasn't normal you know you how to make that work it went against all logic that you'd apply to a Pirelli tyre, you know, start to trail brake and release the brake into the apex where you had to keep so much pressure in that thing to keep it deformed enough to let you turn. And um, it went, I just kept thinking I was going to crash and I kept staring down the barrel of this bike when I was sat in the garage thinking, if I crash this thing, it's probably worth more than I am, you know? It's so expensive, the bike, and I was kind of in awe of it. I was kind of scared of it, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Probably didn't help the fact that when I walked to the first test for the first time Nakamoto told me hey just come and enjoy this and don't crash the bike and I was like oh (laughs) you know thanks for them that great uh, demotivator I'm just going to ride around now so there's part of me that wish I'd have threw um, caution to the wind a bit and and got stuck in but I had a 7th and 8th and worked with some great great engineers and learned a lot ate some great hospitality food <laughs> and um, yeah f- felt like a factory Grand Prix rider for a few races it was pretty cool on, on balance those results are actually really good A there was a bit of wet weather to contend with in there do you feel like you got a fair a fair shot at it and is this sort of unfinished business on that side for you definitely not unfinished business I mean my time for a good opportunity in MotoGP has passed mm-hmm. not 32 I am I feel really young and good, but in Grand Prix terms, I'm past it. You know, there's fishing for guys out of Moto3 and Moto2, and, and that's... Uh, but... And I did get a fair crack of it. You know, I got there on the Repsol Honda team. It was uh, one of the best teams around and um, whatnot. But you know, coming in three quarters of the way through a season when everyone's up to speed with little or no testing and both weekends in Mizano I mean this is September this is summer in Europe but both weekends freakishly I had wet weather all three free practice one and two so the first time I rode the thing in anger was the uh, qualifying and and um, it was tough but yeah it is what it is and um, yeah I just like I said I worked with some great guys over there and learned a heap of a lot that I was able to apply in, in Superbike so the main focus of course is now keeping what you're doing going but what about beyond what about beyond this i mean family's got a history in in tt for example are there other things in racing that you would like to tick the box um not really to be honest um i kind of tars will hate me for this but i kind of want to do a bit of vets motocross racing (laughs) yeah (laughs) not right now obviously but i'd like to do some proper family holidays i mean unfortunately my schedule is so busy that I have to combine family holiday times with racing so sometimes after Mizano we stay there and combine it or Portugal or whatnot. so last year was so busy that I vowed that this year I'd try and do a proper family holiday travel the world a bit more see like places because I get to see a lot of the world but I get to see an airport a hire a car and a hotel and a racetrack so um, some of these places I'd like to visit and aside from that just watch the kids grow up and that'll be enough nice let's power to the finish here with a couple of things the late Barry Sheen Mick Do, and Troy Bayless they've all kept bikes from their career have you done the same and is there a favourite 
Yeah, I have my championship bikes now. Uh, also, um, I have my first ever Italojet 50. Do you? It's being restored. Where did you find that? I, um, did, you, did your family keep it? I traced it. We traced it. No, we didn't keep it, but we traced it back and got it, and it's been fully restored. I, the only thing is, it was, it was a heap when we got it, but the ignition cover was gone, so we had to get some parts machine so it's not exactly original but but it's the chassis it's the but yeah it's the thing and uh, it's the it's the bike um that's awesome no i don't collect a lot of bikes and stuff like that but my i mean my my first championship bike's very special yeah. uh in fact together with my 17 bike it looks so out of date now 2015 zx10r yeah it's completely different shape but back then it was like a work of art but uh it's weird how subtle differences things become look really old all of a sudden so but that bike's that's in my uh, trophy room upstairs in the house it's right really nice also I, I restored an old years ago I got this old CB550 restored in a sort of like scrambler dirt tracker style that's thing with flat bars yep. and uh, that's kind of thing. Yeah. yeah Tars told me that we, don't, we don't have anything inside the house there's a room for some stuff in the house but yeah. generally in our house you, there would be no references to motorbikes yeah. but I manage, I've, I've got up to three bikes inside the house now <laughs> so I'm doing well you are doing exceptionally well with the negotiations you mentioned Tash Let, let's talk about her I mean, because we're recording this at Phillip Island she's effectively from here you're very proud I know of your, of your Irish roots but we feel like you're a bit of an adopted Aussie mate aren't you yeah I spend a lot of time out here and the off, generally in the off season not so much now that Jake's at school but um, she, we have a place and we built a place down by the golf course here on Phillip Island and um, a place up in Bright in the Victorian sort of Alps if you like the the mountains so we spend a lot of time there and I, I enjoy the cycling here the community is really nice especially locally I mean she fell into racing by being a waitress at a local restaurant that a team ate in and, and she expressed that she wanted to travel the world and a team boss gave her a coordinator job so I ended up working with her at, uh, with Neil Tuxworth back in 2007. We met then and and then like Andrew Pitt, she was kind of my go-to girl for where should I, what airport should I go to or hire a car and then um, yeah, we got together and, and then made it, a, made it a serious deal. Good on you. Um, do you find it safe when you're cycling on Aussie roads? How do you find the Aussie roads when you're going for a pedal? Yes and no because Aussies are pretty used to cyclists and um, because the weather's good, the culture, I think the what Cadell Evans has done for cycling here has been great. Also the Orica Green Edge effect um, is is made cycling cool, but there is a there's a huge minority of Australians when they get behind the car of a sorry, a huge minority there's a mino- minority of Australians when they get behind the the wheel of a car, they turn into some maniac and especially with cyclists I've I've definitely um, experienced road rage and trying to be run off the road but that's a m- minority and you get that all around the place so I think generally it's um, it's a beautiful place to, to ride your bike you know you should be very proud There's, the roads are incredible um, the coffee culture and cycling is incredible you know you can't not have a ride without a nice cappuccino and a <laughs> dirty muffin at the end of it so um, yeah it's a nice place to ride a bicycle cool Five track and do you have a, uh, a habit that annoys you when you're on the road my favourite track would probably it'd be a toss up between here honestly not that I'm great great here but uh, here in Portimao for two different reasons here because you're always in fourth and fifth gear around corners like nowhere else in the world and Portimao because it's the closest thing to a motocross track you know your bikes dance it's like a roller coaster so that and you say do you have a pet is there a pet hate that you know when you're on the road when you're driving that other motorists do something that really annoys you um oh here in Australia I've got I can't understand the roads here <laughs> you know like I always get amped to come in here and I land in Tullamarine such a good mood and then I get on that Monash and I'm like oh <laughs> what am I doing and you've got like trucks in the outside lane got people undertaking there's like no system you know in Europe we've got a slow lane a sort of passing lane and then a really fast lane and you'll do 100 k's an hour right and you pass someone at 101 they're going to convince you like you're going to kill someone <laughs> and it's like it's so funny like you, it's the most laid back culture everyone but Behind a wheel, it's it's funny. So I do. Um, I, I I I think I got I got pulled over once. Then I think it was 120 k somewhere over the speed limit. Yeah. 
And this, this copper was going to convince me that I was a murderer. He was trying to convince me that I was a murderer. But standard speed limits in Europe are like 130, and, yeah. and that's completely normal. But this guy was going off on one at me, and I was like, I was just like, <laughs> why does everyone just get so tense all, all of a sudden? But yeah, that's uh, definitely the traffic system here is. Um, it's a bit of a free for all and people get uptight, but yeah, I can deal with that because the people are pretty cool. Last one. If Tash gave you the green light, if you could get the Grail machine, whatever it is, it could be an historic bike, an historic car, it could be something cool that's currently out there, what would you have to have in the garage? Ooh. I mean, she would let me have whatever, but. Uh... I don't know. I'm kind of doing a project. I'm trying to put a, a 250 two-stroke motocross engine, KX 250, and a like a recent KX 450 chassis. Yep. So that's going to take up a lot of space in the garage and whatnot. So she might have to park her logs outside for a bit. <laughs> What's the reason behind that project? Why are you doing that? I don't know. I just thought it'd be cool to do a bit of a hybrid bike. Because yep. um, two-strokes are cool. You know, and they've kind of died off the face of the earth in racing terms. So if I could make an old, I think, 2008 was the last year Kawasaki did a, a competitive two stroke 250 engine so I'm trying to find a good donor engine at the minute I've got the chassis waiting there and I just need to cut it in a few areas of course I'll not cut it I'll get someone to help me but um, yeah I've got the donor chassis and bits and bobs already for it and nice suspension so I just need to get a, a good donor engine yeah, It's been fantastic to talk to you mate you're exceptionally grounded for what you've um, what you've achieved and it's it's enormously difficult to get this kind of time on a World Superbike weekend so we, we really appreciate that you're on a roll you're showing no signs of slowing down only rider in history with four straight World Superbike titles record for most victories and podiums in the paddock mate just congratulations thanks phenomenal. so much Greg thank you Rusty's Garage is written and presented by me, Greg Rust. Series producer and editor is Alex Mitchell. Audio production by Darcy Thompson. Listener.